D-Day, the Allied assault on Hitler's fortress Europe, occurred 75 years ago this year. The landings commenced on June 6, 1944. More than 150,000 Allied troops would be involved in the largest amphibious invasion in history, landing at the points of northern France that were codenamed Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword. Of the nearly 7,000 naval vessels that supported this massive landing, there was one that had already been sunk by the Axis powers three and a half years earlier. The D-Day contributions of the USS Nevada, the only battleship to have been both at the attack on Pearl Harbor and the Normandy landings, deserves to be remembered. The landing area called Utah Beach was the point that was farthest west of the landings at D-Day. The goal was to cut off the Cotentin Peninsula in the hopes of capturing the port of Cherbourg, which Allied planners considered critical for supplying the European beachhead. The attack on Utah Beach was led by some 21,000 men of the U.S. 4th Infantry Division, supported by tanks of the 70th Tank Battalion. Utah Beach, and contrary to some apocryphal stories, there is no special meaning to the name, was defended by troops of the 709th Static Infantry Division. The division was made up largely of non-German conscripts, and it was assigned to occupation duties, and so was not as well equipped or trained as most troops of the German army. Their combat effectiveness was further reduced, as its more veteran units had been transferred to the Eastern Front, and the troops facing the 4th Infantry Division largely lacked combat experience. They were not trained in mobile warfare. They had little mechanized support. Still, they were trained in static defense. They knew their sector well, and the area had been heavily fortified. In an attempt to limit any landing, the Germans had flooded the farmland behind the beach, restricting the available travel. Even if the Allies could isolate the Cotentin Peninsula, the port of Cherbourg had significant defenses, including heavy guns. Utah Beach included a formidable seawall that had to be breached for the tanks of the 70th Tank Battalion to be able to move inland. The soldiers assaulting Utah Beach were fortunate. During the pre-battle aerial bombardment, the area had low cloud cover. Instead of abandoning the mission, the bomber group decided to attack from a lower altitude, placing their planes at greater risk. The decision meant that their bombing was more accurate and effective than it had been at other landing points, for a loss of only four bombers. What's more, the soldiers of the 4th Infantry Division had a significant naval bombardment group for support, centered on the battleship USS Nevada. Nevada had been the most modern battleship in the world when it was launched in July 1914. The first of the American standard-type battleships, the Nevada incorporated a number of important innovations that would be a part of all U.S. battleships that followed, including an oil-fired steam power plant rather than coal boilers, geared turbines, and all-or-nothing armor, which provided maximum armor over critical places like engines and magazines, and none over less important places. This allowed better armor over critical points for less weight. Nevada also was the first American battleship to mount three guns in a turret, allowing it to mount ten massive 14-inch guns in four turrets. Two battleships of the class were built, Nevada and Oklahoma. Both had been on Battleship Row on December 7, 1941. Nevada had not been moored next to another battleship, and was so, so was the only U.S. battleship to get underway during the Japanese attack. She was struck by one torpedo and four aerial bombs. Taking on water, she grounded near Ford Island to prevent her sinking in deeper water. Thus, Nevada was sunk in the first few minutes of America's violent entry into World War II, along with the battleships Arizona, California, West Virginia, and her sister ship, Oklahoma. Arizona, whose magazine had exploded, and Oklahoma, struck by as many as eight torpedoes, were too damaged for salvage. But the other three battleships sunk that day were raised and returned to service. Using massive cranes, by mid-February, Nevada was refloated and repaired enough to sail to Puget Sound for repairs and modernization. She was at sea again in October of 1942, participated in the Battle of Attu in Alaska in May of 1943, and after more modernization and convoy duty in the Atlantic, was one of six battleships used to support the D-Day landings along with the battleships Texas and Arkansas, and the British battleships Warspite, Ramblies, and Rodney. Nevada, the only battleship to be both at Pearl Harbor and at Normandy, and the only battleship assigned to support the landings at Utah Beach, had something to prove to the Axis that had sunk her three and a half years before. The attack on Utah included approximately 14,000 paratroops of the U.S. 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions. Their job was to take critical crossroads, prevent reinforcement of Cherbourg, some of the heaviest fighting took place behind the landing points at places like St. Maraglise, where the lightly armed paratroops who had suffered significant casualties and were dispersed in the landings desperately needed reinforcement. The big guns of Nevada, able to fire more than 15 miles, would be critical in breaking up enemy formations and preventing them moving reinforcements behind the lines. The invasion was massive. 
Nevada crewman Ralph Potts told the Reno Gazette Journal in 2004 that you couldn't see the sky. There were so many airplanes flying overhead. Eugene Kidd, a Stuart First Class in one of the support vessels, was quoted in the Nevada State Journal of Reno, Nevada in October of 44. One of the greatest convoys in naval history was to engage in the battle under the aerial protection of fortresses, spitfires, P-37s, and dive bombers, which made a virtual floor in the sky, fenced in by 24 miles of destroyers, cruisers, battleships, supply and hospital ships, LSTs, PT boats, and landing boats of all descriptions. Petty Officer Franklin Sturgis on a Nevada gun crew said it was an immense thing to see, something one could never forget. The naval bombardment began at 4.45 a.m., 45 minutes before H hour. According to some reports, the Nevada was among the first of the Allied Armada to come under fire, a close call that straddled the ship, landing shells on either side. Nevada's captain, Paul Rhea, said, We got out of that particular spot damn fast. But then came Nevada's turn. Kidd recalled, I saw the battleship Nevada was the first to fire with any results on the shore, knocking out two batteries in a quarter of an hour. Petty Officer Sturgis, quoted in the Berkshire County Eagle of Pittsburgh, Massachusetts, explained, Our job was to drench the beast with gunfire before troops landed to knock out enemy strong points afterwards. One of the first priorities was to knock holes in the Utah Beach's seawall, otherwise the tanks of the 70th Armored Battalion would be stuck on the beach. Nevada's 14-inch guns, lobbing 500-pound shells filled with TNT, quickly knocked four huge holes in the wall. But the Germans had nearly 70 different gun emplacements in the fortified area. The shells were coming close. Crewman Potts recalled, We were getting shelled so close that we had to be like soldiers in a foxhole. I was on the port side, I had to go over to the starboard side to keep from getting splashed because the shells were getting too close. The firing was heavy, Potts recalled, the guns got so hot that they got splashed with water, they sizzled. The first troops and tanks to the beach were drawn farther south by the tide than they expected, hitting the beach some 2,000 yards from their assigned landing zones. The mistake turned out to be fortunate, as the tide had dragged away many of the dangerous beach obstacles. Among the troops was the most senior allied officer to land on the beach on D-Day. Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt, Jr., the son of the former president and assistant division commander of the 4th Infantry Division. He quickly appraised the situation and determined that the accidental landing spot was superior to the original plans, and ordered further landings there, saying he decided to start the war from right here. But the beach was protected by two German strongpoints composed of heavy guns under massive concrete casemates near the French hamlet of La Dune de Varve. The casemates were manned by soldiers of the 1st Battalion of the Grenadier Regiment 919 and mounted the dreaded German 88s, 8.8 centimeter guns, as well as numerous other pieces. The strong points had to be neutralized in order to protect the thousands of troops on their way. Troops of the 3rd Battalion of the 22nd Infantry Regiment, accompanied by Sherman tanks of the 1st Platoon of Company A of the 746th Tank Battalion, attacked the bunkers, but the 75 millimeter guns of the tanks had no effect on the heavy concrete. The assault was driven back, losing a tank to the 88s. And so they called in the mighty 14-inch guns of Nevada. After pounding the two massive casemates and forcing the Germans to retreat, Rhea ordered Nevada to move in another 1,100 yards. This, was not, this not only allowed her 14-inch guns to better support the paratroopers, desperately holding positions inland, but allowed the Nevada to bring her batteries of 5-inch and twin 40mm guns into range, pounding the pillboxes and machine guns and other secondary fortifications along the beach. Seaman First Class Jay Gibbon of Lee's Summit, Missouri, was a loader in one of the five-inch guns. His crew officer noticed that after each round, Gibbon held up his right hand. The officer assumed that the signal meant okay and continued feeding the gun. In fact, in the fast loading, Gibbon's, had been caught, Gibbon's hand had been caught between two shells. His finger was broken and nearly severed. In the first two hours and ten minutes of firing, Gibbon loaded 26,730 pounds, more than 30 tons of five-inch shells, with a broken finger until someone figured out what his signal meant and he was replaced. Despite the injury, he never let the fire falter. Another crewman loaded over 800 shells weighing 70 pounds each over a period of four hours without relief. Sturgis recalled, I worked hard passing ammunition. We slept on the deck and ate K rations. That was how the entire crew fought the battle. A war correspondent aboard Nevada said of them, These are men who slept only an hour or two during all this time. Slept for 15 minutes at a time, sitting upright in radio rooms. Slept for half an hour at a time, sprawled over one another on the gun mounts. Nevada, at times the only artillery available inland, was renowned for the accuracy of its fire. Its missions were critical to the lightly armed airborne troops trying to hold causeways and crossroads, now being assaulted by German armor. A firing mission on June 8th was called to attack a formation of 90 tanks and 20 lorries, and then bombard the road that they had used to get there. In 20 minutes, they were told by the spotter, fire very effective. All tanks and lorries destroyed or damaged. None 
got away. Ship was able to fire with such accuracy because of the close coordination between Navy and Army. As the Danville Morning News of Danville, Pennsylvania explained in July of 1944, each Army battalion was assigned a fire control party consisting of one Naval and one Army officer and 12 Army enlisted men who were technicians skilled in radio communications. The Navy men were given Army training and the Army men were given Navy training to the extent that all the men in the unit understood both the problems of the ground and sea forces in the operation. An Army spotter near St. Mary Glees, First Lieutenant Joseph Hull, was contacted by a patrol of paratroopers trapped by a concentration of nine enemy tanks. Hull said, I contacted the Nevada, and the second salvo hit the first two tanks in line. That was some shooting, so I called for rapid fire, and in a short while the Nevada had scored direct hits on seven of the tanks. The two remaining tanks were destroyed by exploding ammunition from the others. Army Fire Control Officer First Lieutenant William B. French said, The Nevada shooting was the prettiest sight of the war as far as the paratroopers were concerned. Those guns cleared out that road like a bulldozer. Nevada's fire was so accurate that at times it was firing 15 miles to hit targets less than 500 yards from Allied troops. When an aerial spotter called in the location of a 155mm battery, in less than an hour the plane spotting reported guns, shelter, headquarters, all completely destroyed. Nevada continued to attack troop concentrations, breaking up counterattacks and disrupting German attempts to reinforce Cherbourg. Another time a spotter called in a battery of four German guns. Nevada straddled the guns in just two shots, completely silencing the battery in less than 20 minutes. The Nevada had done so from an astounding 17 and a half miles away. From the start of the bombardment, the crew of the Nevada was at general quarters, meaning the crew was at battle stations firing their guns for 80 hours straight. The Boston Globe described the more than 1,214 inch shells fired in the first six days of the invasion as approximately one and a half million of your war bonds that couldn't be better spent. The Danville Morning News of Danville, Pennsylvania opined that the slugger of the ships which made the assaults on the shore positions in France was the Nevada. The battleship has become legend among the thousands of doughboys in France. And in perhaps the most direct compliment regarding the Navy's role at D-Day, Lieutenant Colonel Joe Rudder of the 2nd Raider Battalion said, Tell the Navy, we love them. The assault on Utah Beach was costly. The paratroopers suffered some 2,500 casualties and another 700 men died at sea. But the 4th Infantry Division landed 21,000 men on the beach at Utah for a cost of only 197 casualties. A stunning fact for which the heavy and accurate fire of the USS Nevada deserves some credit. Her heavy guns would be needed again just a few days later for the assault on Cherbourg, and then later in August, and the second D-Day, the attack on southern France called Operation Dragoon, before she was sent to the Pacific and participated in the bombardment during the Battle of Okinawa. After the war, more than 32 years old, the Navy decided that Nevada was simply too old to retain. But she proved difficult to sink. She survived not one, but two atomic blasts. One in which she was literally painted orange because she was supposed to be the target of the bomb, and yet she did not sink. She was hauled to Hawaii, used for target practice by the USS Iowa. Failed to sink her. Finally, she was sunk by an aerial torpedo. Stubborn to the last. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.